Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest today is Nora Gedgaudis, who's a certified nutritional therapist and a neurofeedback specialist and the author of Primal Body, Primal Mind, Beyond the Paleo Diet for Total Health and a Longer Life. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Jenea. It's really we an honor. found you <laughs> after taping Lear Keith's book, the about her book, The Vegetarian Myth. Yeah. And what we learned there, particularly thinking about sustainability for the planet, but also for us, it utterly transformed our lives. We ba Robin and I basically went on the primal light diet, very ultra low carbs, lost weight, have more energy, have more endurance. So when we you found- You look fabulous. I thank you much. Yeah. <laughs> when we found your book, well, we read it aloud. <laughs> And there was just so many riches yeah. that we found, so much that you had researched that validated, that, that informed, that it was just, well, we wanted to meet you. Okay. And have you share that with other people? Because diet is certainly a highly personal and very controversial area at this point, and more is being learned, which you've done a beautiful job of, of bringing to us. So Thank you. Thank you. Start us with, what do you mean by primal? So when I talk about primal, I'm talking about the origins of what established our physiological makeup, what sorts of things established our nutritional requirements. And uh, I, I came to that through um, actually a couple of different things. One is I stumbled across the work of Weston Price quite a long time ago, it was somewhere between 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, and that a light bulb went off for me on that and I understood that you know he was looking he looked some at native diets and he was looking at traditional diets but I thought whoa I want to dig back even further and find out what are the evolutionary roots of our you know of our nutritional uh, needs and that sort of got me going on that I also spent uh, close to three months living less than 500 miles from the North Pole with a family of wild wolves. Now this, this mm. was related to some work in wildlife science that I was involved with at the time. We were doing behavioral studies of, of this family of wolves that this wolf biologist that I was in the company of had found back in 1986 and he was, goes up every single summer to this day uh, and uh, lives with the same family and observes the changes in the pack and uh, you know does all sorts of um, <clears throat> takes all sorts of information down and it's, it's a unique place in the world because it's the only place on earth where wolves have never really been hunted um, in any recent uh, historical context. The nearest human village to this particular area where the den was was about 350 miles to the south of where we were. And that was uh, an Inuit village of a, about a hundred people um, and they just don't get up there. You know? so, so it was a fairly industrial strength religious experience for me. Uh, I had a long, uh, lifelong interest and uh, passion about wolves. That's a whole other subject matter. And all the while I'm sitting there on the tundra observing these animals and, and watching them sleep for long, long hours. And I'm looking out over this extremely primitive landscape where you know, this wasn't, this whole area wasn't even glaciated during the last ice age. The uh, glaciers actually started uh, s uh, south of there. Um, mm -hmm. It was just too far north. So it's an extremely old landscape. But I'm looking at that thinking, you know, Northern Europe might not have been too different than this. Um, when Cro-Magnon humans came marching across 40,000 years ago, you know, there was permafrost and there are seasons but the summer seasons are short and you know cool and that things don't quite fully thaw and there was not a whole bunch of edible plant life and up to that point I'd sort of been led to believe that a plant-based diet was by far the healthiest diet that this is foundational for human health and I'm thinking if, if that's true how did they do it the other thing I noticed was that the entire time I'm sitting out there on the tundra um, <clears throat> and I had been eating a mostly plant-based, not a totally plant-based diet, but a mostly plant-based diet when I left to go up there that particular year. 
and I sort of expected to miss that, and I didn't at all. And what I was craving, though, was uh, was fat-rich food. The most. I was not dreaming of a salad out there on the tundra. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, my 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 thoughts were entire. As a matter of fact, once a week we made it to uh, a weather station that was some distance away. We made a little pilgrimage so that we could get a shower in, um, and and possibly even if we were lucky, make a phone call for you know five all of five minutes, um, and uh, kind of just sort of get ourselves you know cleaned up and pick up some new supplies or whatever. The uh, officer in charge told us that we could go into the mess hall and anything that was sitting out that we were interested in eating, we could, we could certainly partake of. We always went around 3 o'clock in the morning when there was nobody else there. It was 24-hour daylight, you know, so yeah, it was, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I, whenever I made it into that mess hall, I made an immediate beeline to this enormous bowl of butter that was sitting there. And I took, it. You know, I was eating bread in those days, and so I put toast in the toaster. And that was like a vehicle for the butter, right? And the butter was like that. And I just couldn't get enough of it. I yeah. just ate that until I yeah. thought, well, I can't, I shouldn't eat anymore, you know, but I really, really wanted it. The other thing, and I was astonished at myself for mm -hmm. wanting it mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. When I got back uh, to the States, I found that I had lost probably about 25 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, doing not much more than sitting on my backside for an entire summer. Um, Eating, eating fat rich foods. I was eating salami, eating cheese, eating, you know, all this stuff that I would have thought would have made me fat. And that's the heart of what the astonishment was for us when I went on to basically the primal diet and t took the carbs out, yes. most of them. And of course you had to compensate, so it was the good fats, you know, right. coconut oil, butter, and so on. Um, keeping the protein moderate as you really emphasize here we learned later yeah it was like I couldn't believe that if I got hungry and want a spoonful of coconut oil and then I'm satisfied and I'm, and the carb cravings go away I it was like here was the place where it was the hardest change because I've right. been so indoctrinated as we all have right. about the low-fat diet being best and I've been on a nearly vegetarian diet as well right so so I, I it's and it's very hard to explain to people because your body is in a different comes into a different state, at least mine did. Yeah. Well, what we have to realize is that all of us, of course, regardless of our ideologies, regardless of our ethnicity, uh, all of us are fundamentally genetically hunter-gatherers, all of us, that we all come from those same roots. See, the thing about ice ages, and, and especially where you're going through these periods of advance and these big swings of climate change, is that they're not about snow and ice necessarily, they're about extremes. They're about extremes of cold, but also extremes of heat, drought, mm -hmm. and wildfires. Mm -hmm. During the time that North America was locked in snow, snow and ice during the last um, <clears throat> period of glacial advance, uh, Africa was being ripped apart by drought and wildfires. Uh, this would have, and there was also quite a bit of you know, volcanic activity. And volcanic activity can have tremendous effects on plant growth and things like that all over the planet, sure. as well as climate, sure. uh, air, you know, and temperature and all of that. So, yeah. So you were saying, I'm going to see you back here, you're saying that basically we're, we've been hunter-gatherers most of the time of human evolution. Right. And what I would, and, you know, to survive those extremes, right. at least. But we haven't, have our genes changed? I mean, are we? We're 99.99% the same as we were wow. during the period that where wow. we were hunter-gatherers. Um, very, very little has changed. We've had agriculture for less than 0.4% of our Dang. evolutionary history, and yet we've changed genetically in that time period less than 0.05%. And there's just, it takes anywhere most geneticists would agree, 40 to 100,000 years mm. for our genes mm. to fully catch up to major changes, you know, big major changes in, 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 uh, in our, you know, in conditions, in, in, in diet and all those sorts of things. It just hasn't been long enough for us to fully adapt to what is, what has become an agriculturally based lifestyle. Which is here we are and, right. and I mean, part of what you're saying is that's not the optimal it's not, it's not who we what are. You, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and part of the point I wanted to make by going into all this Ice Age stuff, which I realize seems off topic, but the other point to the whole business of us being all hunter-gatherers, we're all also fundamentally Ice Age beings. 
-hmm. Fat to us means survival. Okay? Fat is fundamentally, and survival trumps absolutely everything else. Sure. And so dietary fat uh, being the most nutrient-dense thing that we can possibly consume, rich in fat, soluble nutrients, and all these other things, essential for the development and the functioning of our brain and nervous system, right? <clears throat> and there are many different types of fats involved in that. Roughly half the fat in our brain is saturated fat. About 11% of it is arachidonic acid, evil arachidonic acid, right? And, and uh, maybe 25% of the essential fatty acids are docosahexaenoic acid, which is this uh, primary essential fatty acid found in, uh, among other things, you know, wild game, grass-fed meat, and obviously mm. people mm. associate it with wild-caught fish. Our ancestors got this from cracking the marrow out of bones, eating the brains out of the skulls of the animals they hunted, mm -hmm. eating the meat mm -hmm. of the animals that mm -hmm. they hunted in the mm -hmm. organs. Um, and arachidonic acid is one of the other, uh, you know, long chain fats that was these 20 carbon fatty acids that are extremely important for the functioning and the development of the human brain and nervous system, which is, a, as we know, quite a bit different than that of our other primate right. ancestors. So uh, we developed the cunning to figure out how to bring down mm -hmm. larger animals. And uh, there's a very interesting bit of research that's been done now at the Center for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, it's the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. The man by the name of Professor Michael Richards has been doing this work now for quite a number of years. And what, they, what they've been doing is, is doing something that they call stable isotopic analysis of human bone collagen and also the collagen of other animals because they're looking at what, what everything was eating. And they've gotten samples now of, of human remains from virtually all time periods of our evolutionary history. And, and what they're able to do with this is, is use a radio mass spectrometer to go in there and analyze exactly what we were eating, right? Where, we, where were we getting our, our yes, mainly yes, where yes. we were getting our protein sources, right. right? And it turns out that not only were we very high level carnivores throughout, as were our close cousins, the Neanderthals that we lived with contemporaneously in, in Europe, in ancient Europe, but we were actually higher level carnivores than bears, wolves, or foxes, or other known carnivores of the time period. I mean, when you look at the, at the data and, and the graphic representations of this, it's, it's stunning. I mean, it's jaw-dropping. It's like a, our, our protein intake was off the charts compared to these. And I, I think where that comes from is the fact that we had the cunning and the technology to bring down extremely mm. large mm. animals mm. that no longer exist, right? But we had megafauna through a better part of our evolutionary history that we could hunt. And you take down a woolly mammoth, you've got a family barbecue that's lasting a good <laughs> week, right? <laughs> you know? Yes, and, and yes, yes. And, and as anything wild, there is a mentality of feast or famine, which, by the way, we still have. Yes, yes. So yes. Uh, only now we have this unnatural access to this unnatural abundance of food and food-like substances that, um, that you don't have to take more than a couple steps in any direction mm -hmm. to be able mm -hmm. to you know, feed yourself. And we have no grasp of what it was like, you know, to go for days or weeks sometimes, maybe even months, without a really good solid meal, having to kind of pull at scraps and things like that. So, uh, so when food was plentiful, we ate it, right? And yes. you, you bring down a woolly mammoth, you're going to sit there and you're going to, you know, chow down until it's gone. Uh, because you don't know if hunting is going to be That's good right. the next day That's or right. not. That's right. And... Um, and there would have been very high levels of fat in the megafauna as compared sure. to many of the wild animals that, uh, that roam the earth today. A lot of you know, wild deer and things like that mm -hmm. tend to be much leaner, but these larger animals tended to okay. have a lot more fat. And fat has always been coveted by every single yeah. traditional uh, tribal society. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's one of the things that Weston and Price found is that one of the things that was consistent in every primitive and traditional society that he, that he studied was that the most sacred foods in every one of these cultures, the ones that they revered as being the ones essential to their health and well-being um, and their spirituality even, were the fat-rich foods. Yes. And this has always been true. I mean, whole wars have been fought over pemmican, which is 
a mostly fat based with a little bit of ground, you know, meat, powdered jerky or whatever commingled in with it, um, which was a food that uh, uh, the Northern Plains and Northern Indians uh, and uh, natives of Northern Canada all kind of participated in, in, in making pemmican as a way of having a food supply uh, they, that was sort of their version of being a prepper, <laughs> you know, in case yeah, something Yeah, yeah, and the, it's long-lasting. It's long-lasting, it doesn't it. spoil, and you can live on it. Everything that's needed for our, your health is in there. Actually, one of the things that struck me from your book, it sort of stands out, as you said, the, of the macronutrients, protein, fats, carbohydrates, what you're saying is that carbohydrates the, the are only, not essential at right, all for the humans. The only one for which there is no essential uh, he established human requirement is carbohydrates, dietary requirements. Which are in terms of our metabolism, our physiology, or whatever we need. Anything. We can manufacture all the glucose we need from a combination of, of protein and fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. And really only one to two percent of our physical makeup is actually carbohydrate based in terms of our structural makeup, mostly in the form of connective tissue, some glyconutrients, different things. But we can manufacture all of that from proteins and fats. We don't ever have to consume carbohydrates in order uh, to do that. Which, which, which sort of is says great to me, because there's our beginnings. Right. You know, we ha uh, the body adapted to protein and fat from the megafauna to do everything it needed, you know, develop the brain and so on. Right, absolutely. And so if we had, if we had a fundamental carbohydrate requirement, uh, you know, if you, if you take a good look at how we evolved and what, our, what the Earth's geologic history has been during the period of our evolution. I mean, we became fully human 200,000 years ago during one of the colder, time, colder mm -hmm. snaps. Mm -hmm. um, we just wouldn't be here. You know, we have to be able to make uh, use of what's available. And uh, what's very clear is from the stable isotopic analysis, which was purely objective work done. There was no hidden agenda in mm -hmm. any of that. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't trying to cherry pick data or anything else. Um, and it, we were such high level carnivores that, um, you know, I don't know where we would have had room for anything else. And you know, it's unlikely we would have been uh, looking for baked potatoes with those woolly mammoth steaks, you know, anyway, because most of what we think of today is some of the higher calorie carbohydrate based foods in the wild are extremely toxic and mm, uh, mm, and through mm, most mm. of the year in most places in the world things that would have been you know, like wild potatoes uh, are so toxic they just wouldn't have even been considered and it would have really only been once we developed the the universal use of fire uh, as a way of preparing food and that kind of thing uh, which by most accounts you know agree that it that's really only been maybe about 50,000 years where we've sort of universally uh, adopted fire for that. Scattered evidence of fire around mm -hmm. uh, for cooking meat, you know, where they find charred bones around mm -hmm. campfires and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, when it's cold out, hot meat's got to taste pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. actually making use of plant foods by cooking them and making them less toxic, which wild foods, wild plant foods really are, and that, that's the other consideration. That's because plants don't want to get eaten. Right. When you think about what our ancient primitive humans ate. There's a lot of argument and debate about that, and a lot of speculation, although you know the work of the Max Planck Institute helps dispel a lot of that. But one thing we can say for sure is we know pretty well what they didn't eat. You know, they, they weren't eating uh, any appreciable amount of grains. In fact, in all the isotopic analysis studies, they literally found no evidence whatsoever of grain-based protein in, in, in those mm. isotopes. Which isn't to say that we didn't occasionally come across plants that had those and nosh on, you know, whatever, because, you know, we're going to eat whatever's available to us, given whatever the, the season, conditions the time are. of year, sure. the climatic conditions, whatever, the area of the world. But uh, in terms of being any significant protein source for us, no. So, uh, so basically, where was I? About the plants. Plants, yes, plants. So uh, plants are basically, you know, unlike animals, which have teeth and nails and, and feet to run away and all that kind of thing, they have their own defenses. Plants don't. They sit there and they're kind of stuck if something comes along and wants to eat them. So they develop biochemical defenses. Mm -hmm. And in the wild, it's, there are lots and lots of compounds that make wild plants 
potentially perilous to consume, at least in any real significant quantity. Um, some are, are better than others, but some things are, will literally kill you. Other things can just simply um, either greatly inconvenience you or mess with your endocrine system or you know, or your, your guts, your, or, or your gut, right. or you know, or any number of things. So, and now, is that still true with domestic plants? You yes, know, there the, are still anti-nutrients, as they call them, mm, in mm. domestically cultivated plants. Particularly, grains and legumes are still rife with these things. Um, you know, the grains and, and, and legumes, in particular, contain phytates, which can bind minerals and make them unavailable mm -hmm. for absorption. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not just the minerals in those foods, but will literally draw them out of your body. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. You can give wow. yourself very serious, for instance, zinc deficiencies and things by consuming a diet that's very high in, in legumes uh, and, and whole grains. Um, and and uh, they're also, uh, legumes in particular have uh, goitrogen, you know, goitrogenic mm -hmm. substances mm -hmm. in them that can impair your thyroid function. Uh, there are... Um, also trypsin inhibitors, things that can in interfere with your ability to digest and absorb protein over time. Wow. Wow. Now this is certainly an advantage to the plant that would you know, really rather inconvenience us long term, but in terms of human nutrition, I think that there are far more things in these foods that are likely to compromise us than they are to support, support our health. I think historically in, in traditional cultures, um, some of these foods were better tolerated. I don't mm. know that they were ever a health food, mm. you know? Mm. And the problem is, uh, and I'm a member of the Weston Price Foundation, I, I admire a lot of the work that they've done over the years and I support a lot of the work that they do. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't live in Weston Price's time anymore. Mm.